Okay, so we're going to do chapter 49, but remember we're not doing any of the slides or any of the information regarding the electrocardiography or EKG, okay? So we're on chapter 49, but we will be focusing in on pages 1088 to 1091. So it's the last three or four pages of the chapter, okay? So the outcomes, we're going to skip these initial outcomes. And the two that we're going to focus on here are 47, 49.7 and 49.8, where we're carrying out the different um, types of pulmonary function testing. And then we'll discuss um, the procedure for performing a pulse ox and what that means and what it's for. Okay. Okay. So the first area we'll talk about is pulmonary function testing. And sometimes you'll see pulmonary function testing acronymed as PFTs, or you'll hear it acronymed that way, okay? And PFTs um, are used to evaluate lung volume as well as lung capacity. And we'll talk about the different volumes that are involved and how we measure that in the lungs, okay? Um, and so the pulmonary function testing can be used to not only detect and diagnose, but also classify different pulmonary disorders, okay? The primary ones that are used with pulmonary function testing are asthma and COPD, or which is also chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now, those are the most common, uh, but there are other disease processes that are more rare, like cystic fibrosis, um, pulmonary fibrosis, sarcoidosis. There are a number of other chronic respiratory conditions that can also be evaluated with this. They probably aren't as common overall, but they still exist. And the testing that we do here can also help to classify and diagnose those pulmonary disorders as well, okay? So when we're looking at pulmonary function testing, we're generally evaluating a source or reason for shortness of breath. Remember from med term that we have some specific um, terms that relate to respiration and breathing and breathing issues. So the term for um, shortness of breath would be dyspnea, which is difficult or painful breathing. Some other terms that would fall into this category would be orthopnea, which is difficulty breathing in anything but a, a raised or elevated position or standing position. Um, apnea, which is lack of breathing. And so sometimes you'll, when you think of apnea, a lot of times you think of sleep apnea. Um, the word eupnea means normal breathing because EU um, is the term for normal. And so these are just some of the terms that we would talk about related to pulmonary function testing or, or maybe variances from the normal, okay? Um, the other thing that the pulmonary function testing can do is evaluate effectiveness of treatment. So if someone has asthma, um, they can do what's called a pre and a post test where they actually will do an initial test when the, when the individual has not used their asthmatic med asthma medication, give them the medication and then 10 or 15 minutes later, repeat the test and that can give you um, an effectiveness of the actual um, treatment regimen that's given. So that's another reason why you would use pulmonary function testing. So when the first pulmonary function test that we'll talk about is spirometry. This is a very common um, way to measure breathing capacity. Um, there's a lot of different machines. Um, some of them are very large and cumbersome. Others, um, the newer ones are much, much smaller, I mean, more compact and easier to carry around. So you'll see a number of different kinds of uh, different apparatuses that are used. Um, an allergist office, allergy and immunology or pulmonology or even cardiology would probably be the most common uh, specialties that you would see spirometry in. But if you had a primary care physician that had a high um, incidence of those patients, they might actually purchase one and go through and do it and then make treatment regimens according to that. Um, and so when you're looking at the actual spirometer itself, um, you can see this particular one in the picture here has a very large mouthpiece that has a, a tubing that can then, then connects to um, some sort of computerized apparatus that can measure these volumes, um, the volume of air that's expired 
and then do printout readouts, do it like a printable readout so you can actually see the volumes that are that are present. And so when we're doing a spirometry, um, the lung volume that we're measuring is something called forced vital capacity. And so vital capacity is sort of the maximum air that you can inhale and exhale. And so in this particular case, you're doing a forced exp um, expiration. So we're trying to empty the air of as much air as we possibly can. And so we're doing what's called a forced vital capacity. And you will see that acronym FVC. Okay. So that's what we're measuring um, with a spirometry. Uh, prep and performance is important because if it's not done correctly, it will alter um, the results. And so patient prep is important. Uh, page. 1089 goes through some of the reasons why you might um, postpone or not do um, a spirometry. And so they list them here that if anybody's had any kind of acute illness or viral infection within the past two to three weeks, that could alter what that patient would be considered their normal. And so you generally would hold off on that. Okay. Um, certain serious medical conditions like a recent heart attack, you'd probably hold off. Um, doing this test, uh, and then certain certain uh, medications. If you're doing a pre and post test, you would not have wanted them to utilize their um, asthma inhaler usually four to six hours before this test is done. And so, because the idea would be to test them when they actually whatever their normal is, and then give them the medication and see how well they respond to that medication. Okay. Um, sedative and opioid usage can affect this because those particular medications can inhibit respiration or, or cause problems with breathing. And so you would want to administer the test if someone is using those substances. And then smoking um, right before would not be a good idea. You want to at least hold off. You'd want to consult with your primary care physician, but you'd want to know how much time in between um, having a cigarette and actually doing this test. And the one thing is that this test is frequently used for is people with COPD. And so a lot of people are smokers that are using this, but you'd want to know if they had smoked within the past hour or have a, or had a heavy meal within the past hour. Okay, so those are some guidelines on what to ask as far as should we proceed forward. Um, if someone had had one of these things, you'd want to at least consult with a physician before doing the test. And then other prep um, things to prep the patient or to let them know what you're doing. So, you know, in, inform them why we're doing this, what the purpose is, um, and then explain that if the test isn't done properly, we won't get accurate results. And so, although this test can be a little difficult to do, it's not painful, um, but forcing the air out for a specific amount of period of time can actually be more difficult than you think. And so positioning is important. Um, and you might even have to go through and demonstrate the procedure yourself first in order for them to completely understand what they're supposed to do, okay? So when you're actually going through the maneuver itself, you're gonna actually have to kind of force, a, um, kind of do a, a real vocal coaching with them and provide feedback. And so, because what can happen is it's very difficult to blow out when you're actually taking this deep breath in and expiring fully, you have to, in order to get all the air out, you have to do this, this maneuver for about six seconds. And so trying to get people to go that entire six seconds, especially when they're elderly or they have respiratory issues can be very difficult, okay? Um, so you're generally gonna have the patient perform the test three times. Um, hopefully all three are acceptable, but you need three acceptable maneuvers. And so you may have to have the patient repeat um, the test until they get three acceptable um, ones. And the machine that you do will actually tell you if the maneuver is acceptable or not, okay? Um, observing the patient to make sure that dizzy or lightheaded. And you can see here that this boy has a nose clip. Um, generally, positioning is important. You want to make sure your chin is up and pointed outward a little bit. Um, they're going to take as big a breath in as they can, and then they're going to blow hard out. You're going to need a big, huge, forcible blow within the first second or two, and then they have to maintain that expiration for six seconds. And that can be sometimes difficult to do. Okay, so positioning is important. They should be sitting upright um, in the sitting position with the chin up, head kind of forward, nose clip on, 
and then they need to make sure that they expire out for a full six seconds. The other um, thing to make sure of is that the patient doesn't lean forward. Sometimes people, when they're struggling to get that last couple of seconds of the air out, their, their first um, instinct is to kind of lean forward to help them get that air out, but it's important that they stay upright, okay? And I think the book kind of shows you the acceptable position versus the unacceptable position. Okay. And so once again, you can see this one's a much smaller, um, this mouthpiece is much smaller. She's got her nose clip on. Um, and so oftentimes, once again, they'll, they'll do a pretest and a post-test. And the pretest would be without medication. Then they would administer the medication and then repeat the test. And the hope would be that the medication is helping that person and their, their uh, volumes would increase with that medication. All right, and so it can be difficult sometimes for patients to do this, and so that's why the demonstration process is really important. You may have to go through and show the patient how to do it so they can see you um, and actually have a clue as to what you're talking about. You're also going to have to coach them through. For that six seconds, it can be tough, and so um, you can kind of hear the machine. It kind of makes a high-pitched sound, and as it's getting closer, it'll kind of have a beep, and so coaching them to that point saying keep going keep going keep going keep going keep going is really important because they need to kind of hear that voice so they know not to stop because if you just kind of sit there quietly they might just give one exhale quickly and and you'll have to coach them through so that's why we we need to be real vocal and communicate well so they understand um, what's going on and what they need to do because even if they understand sometimes it's difficult to perform and so you can have uncooperative whether it's intentionally or unintentionally uncooperative patients. They may not understand what you're talking about. They might struggle to follow directions and they may be just unable to perform the procedure. So the more coaching, the more communication, the more direction you give and demonstration will help ensure that the patients can perform an accurate test. Uh, there is a calibration syringe and this is sort of um, a way that you can do a testing all of we've talked about how machines have to be tested standards have to be used in order to make sure the machine is working you can't just use it all the time and not check it um, so there has to be a calibration syringe that has a certain pre selected amount of air that you in, that you can actually insert into the mouthpiece and they keep a daily logbook to make sure that we know that it's actually functioning correctly okay um, some of these pieces are disposable and some are not. So if they're disposable, you would throw everything away. The biohazard or dispose appropriately as to what your your um, facility directs. Um, or if it's some of the things are not, you would have to clean them um, and disinfect them after each use. Okay. All right, so that's spirometry and we do have spirometers in class. Um, and unfortunately, with COVID this year, we're going to have to do some alterations. We won't be able to do this in class, but we're going to go through and watch some videos and walk through it as much as we possibly can. Okay. So another type of pulmonary function testing is called a peak expiratory flow rate. Um, another acronym for this particular test is called, is called forced expiratory volume, FEV. And so as opposed to trying to completely empty all of the air in six seconds out of your lungs, this one is one quick, rapid, forceful um, expiration in one second. Okay, and so sometimes it's called FEV1 because you're doing it in one second. This test is generally used um, with a peak flow meter and it's most commonly used for asthmatics or anybody that's got a chronic respiratory condition, primarily asthma, um, and it can actually reveal whether or not we have narrowing or excessive narrowing of airways um, kind of prior to a full-blown asthma attack. And so most asthmatics have one of these at home so they can track where they're at. And if they start getting into trouble, it can alert them to seek medical attention quick so they don't actually have a full -blown attack. All right. And so there are zones that are associated with this, and the physician usually will predetermine what that individual's zones are. Um, it's not something that, that medical assistants would have to know. 
but you just know, you need to know what the different zones mean and what important advice to give a patient if they called you and said, hey, I'm in the yellow zone, what do I do? I'm in the red zone, what do I do? You don't preset those, but you need to know what would happen if someone was in those zones and how to guide them, okay? So you can see the spirometer here. I'm sorry, the peak flow here. You can see there's a red zone, um, a yellow zone, and a green zone, and then there's a little red tab, and it will it will move um, and give you an amount, a liters per minute amount of air that's being expired. Um, and once again, those zones can kind of guide on whether or not someone's having um, large airway narrowing or bronchoconstriction. All right, so when we look at the zones, it's just like our traffic light. Uh, green zone is good. Green means go, but it also means good control. So if we're in the green zone, then we're hitting about 80% of our normal lung volume or more, and that's good and acceptable. Then we have a yellow zone, and that's usually where we're starting to get bronchoconstriction of some sort, um, and the large airways are beginning to narrow, and that's usually at about 50 to 80 percent of our normal expiratory volume. Um, red zone is not good. That's usually 50 percent or less, and that's usually a medical emergency. Then you need to make sure that they seek help immediately. Okay, we'll go through. We have, I'm going to be able to give everyone a peak flow to at least take home and try um, and work on since we can't really be taking our masks off and breathing without our masks in the room, closed room together. Um, what I'll send, what I'm going to do is send you guys home with a peak flow meter um, and have you guys demonstrate it. Just take a quick video for 30 to 60 seconds and kind of demonstrate it and then you'll send it to me and that's how we'll kind of go through it and mimic this, this particular instrument use, okay? And then the, one of the last ways that we can measure some, uh, you know, measure our, our oxygen saturation is something called pulse oximetry. And so they have some larger units when you're in the hospital, you're going through surgery, um, they have those things that they can tape onto your, onto your finger. Usually when you're in the hospital, it'll be on pretty much 24 seven while you're in there. They do have some smaller units that you can place on the finger and it'll tell you what the pulse is some of them tell you respirations as well as what your oxygen saturation is okay so that oxygen saturation is actually measuring the light absorbed by the hemoglobin which is what carries oxygen within our blood okay that's the protein inside the red blood cells that actually carries the oxygen with the oxygen binds to okay and so when we're looking at it actually is reported in a percent and so 95 to 100 is considered normal oxygen saturation. If someone has a respiratory issue and they drop below 95 or 94 or below, then we would use the term hypoxemia, which means they have less oxygen within the blood that would be considered normal in order to keep our tissues oxygenated, okay? So anytime you're in the hospital, they'll usually do this. Um, Definitely, if someone's got any, you know, pulmonary and or cardiac conditions post-surgery, um, pre and post-surgery, as well as during surgery, it's on. And then a lot of times people that have sleep apnea will also have episodes where their pulse ox will drop really, really low um, during certain uh, sleep hours. And so it's also used in that particular respect as well. All right, so a couple of questions. What is the purpose of pulmonary function testing? So the purpose is, we kind of talked about in that first slide, it's to evaluate lung volume and to evaluate lung capacity. And we can do that by doing spirometry. We can do that by doing peak flow values um, with the peak flow meter. We can also add to that the pulse ox, and that can give us an idea of how that person is respiratory rise and oxygen saturation rise. And what does successful spirometry depend upon? It depends upon making sure that patient, you've prepped them and everything, they don't have any of those contraindications to doing the testing. Make sure they're, um, that you're 
technique is good and that the patient is doing all of the things that they need to do with the procedure wise and then making sure that we analyze the results and making sure you get three acceptable uh, maneuvers and that we can analyze those results okay so here we have a quick we have a question um, Joey is calling the clinic and he's asking some questions about his asthma medication he says he's been using his peak flow meter and his readings have been in the yellow zone so what advice would you give to Joey at that point if he called and said he's asthmatic and he's in the yellow zone so remember yellow means that we're starting to get some narrowing of starting to get some narrowing of the bronchus bronchoconstriction and so if somebody calls you with that you would want to find out whether and how long it had been since they'd taken their medication if he hasn't taken his meditation in a couple hours you'd want him to try his peak flow meter and then recheck his zone after that within 10 to, you know 10 minutes or so and so if it's not improving they might need to come in because that means that could be the sign that things are going to get worse for him okay All right, so this just means large airway is beginning to narrow and that he should take his medication as prescribed. So he decides to come in anyway. Okay, so maybe it stayed yellow and it didn't really improve after he used his medication. So then he comes into the office and you do a pulse ox on him and his pulse ox is 93. So what is this? what does this now mean and what should be done? So at this point, his oxygen saturation is below 95. So he is considered hypoxemic. Okay, so you'd want to alert someone to the fact that he he was there. So you'd want to let a charge nurse know. You'd want to let a physician know that you've got a child who's hypoxemic and has a 93 pulse ox. Probably at that point, what they would do is have you readminister medication, but in a nebulized form. And I'll show you what a nebulizer is in class. Um, and then at that point, recheck his saturation. If his saturation goes up, then he can be assessed and dealt with and, and you know to see what the best course for that patient is if the pulse ox doesn't go up and it still stays at 93 then that person's going to probably have to have some supplemental oxygen probably by nasal cannula and it is possible that we'll have that per, that child would have to be admitted okay because if we're staying down below 95 then that means that we've still got chronic hypoxemia and that they're going to have to do some evaluation for some other things or at least monitor that patient until that pulse ox gets above 95. Okay. All right. So um, that covers the respiratory chapter. Um, we'll talk about some of this stuff in class and the next chapter I, um, so I think we'll go ahead and stop here. Um, we're going to have to alter what we normally do for our um, minimum skills just because of COVID, um, but make sure we go through this and we'll see some videos and go through on how to perform these things while we're in class, okay? All right, so I'm going to check out and I will see you in the next video.